appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen and and let's see what we can share this afternoon. Um, because many of you, if not all of you, um, have your cameras turned off. Um, if you could just give me a give me a sign <laughs> that you can see my screen. Amen. We can see see the screen and and hear you very well. Thank you. Amen. 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 So, in terms of empowerment, I thought that uh, I would briefly share since this is something to empower the community, um, a lot of times people don't know um, the truth behind um, where a plant-based diet came from, has come from. Um, you know, it is a thing that's trending right now. Uh, no matter where you go in the, no matter where you go in the uh, country, uh, the world even, I was in, I was in Switzerland, I was in Rome, Italy. I was in uh, Prague, uh, the beautiful city of Prague. And, and one thing I found consistently is that there is a proliferation of interest in plant-based diet, evidenced by the fact that there are so many plant-based restaurants that are popping up. And it's the thing that's trending. Um, even it was in the news just a few weeks ago, as um, people thought that the current president and administration was going to outlaw hamburgers and cheeseburgers. And um, there was an uproar and lots of memes and tweeting and Twitter activity, and people were just kind of uh, having this debate and discussion. Well, so there's lots of information and lots of talk about a plant-based diet. But I want to talk about the origin of it and what's the purpose of it. You know, this thing that you've heard about and um, just about every restaurant is offering um, options on the menu that are plant-based. And the thing that just floored me that also was very recent was the fact that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a very popular, expensive, luxurious even, um, restaurant in New York City is one that's on, I believe it's on um, Madison Avenue. You know, that's big money. This is where a lot of your stockbrokers and hedge fund uh, executives, you know, who make untold billions, um, they go to, um, to, to actually eat. This restaurant has become plant-based completely. Now you, you could, you know, you could go there and you could get the, the duck a l'orange, um, which you know was their main dish. Also, they had a filet mignon that was the prize of New York City, and you know it would fetch a pretty penny. You know, you if you went to that restaurant, you were expected to, to you know, to drop a few hundred dollars, right? Yet this restaurant has become plant-based completely. Why would they do that? Something is happening all around the world. People's attention is being drawn to this idea of eating differently. I did a plant-based summit three years in a row um, in New York City, same city. And as I did this, this plant-based summit, and they brought in a lot of, you know, well-renowned speakers. I, I just was hanging out with them, but they were much more well-known than I am. And many of them were presenting all this great information from a scientific standpoint, by the way. Um, and it was beautiful, beautiful information, great science, great evidence-based information. But nobody talked about where did this start? And usually that's of interest to us. How did this begin? 
who's to blame? We, we, we often look for a way to point a finger at to who started this thing, right? And for those who may have started something good, we, we applaud them, we celebrate them. Uh, for those who may have started something that has gone afoul, gone wrong or caused harm, we blame them with, with, with punity. We do it and expect there to be repercussions. But no one's really asking the question of where did uh, this whole thing begin? So I want to go back to the beginning. Oh, look at the beautiful fruit and nuts and seeds and kale. By the way, I uh, enjoy farming. Uh, I'm what you would call a gentleman farmer. And now that we have gotten past uh, Mother's Day, that's when everybody starts putting stuff in your garden. That's after the, first, the, the final frost of the year. And we start to get hot, right? For summer, and you can grow all manner of things. And I look at those blueberries there that you can see on your screen. Oh, I've got, I've got 11 blueberry bushes. And they did very well last year. And you know, you learn lots of things as you, as you work in the garden and, and grow your own food. And, Oh boy, the taste is different from what you get at the store, right? But <clears throat> as a plant-based person and now a gentleman farmer, I just do it for fun. I don't sell anything. Um, you, le you learn mighty and powerful lessons in the garden. So um, I'll talk about some of those things, but that's where everything began in a garden. And that was important. It was important for a lot of reasons that things start in a garden. Um, but I don't know if we have evaluated or examined the most important reason why things began in a garden. Now, I wanna look at all three diets that you find in the Bible, because really a plant-based diet actually comes from the Bible. And there were three diets that came and they all came at a specific time. So in the Bible, in Genesis chapter one, verse 29, the first thing you see on our, um, on the graph in front of you, as we look at the continuum of, of diets that were given to man. So the diet at creation, you find in Genesis chapter one and verse 29. And that diet was a plant-based diet. That was the origin. Now, some who, who don't really read the Bible, uh, don't really believe in God, they kind of know the story, right? They know the story that there was a par there was a garden in paradise, and it had all manner of fruit and vegetables and seeds and so forth and grain, right? But they don't know why. They just know that in that story, that's what was the first thing that was given to man. And then as you continue to track the story, God had made a man and then made a woman. <clears throat> and then they had a fall from grace. And then there was a slight shift, a slight change in the diet. And again, no one really knows why. And then you hear about this story of this this cataclysmic flood, the sudden flood that came and decimated the entire known world at that time. And then there was another diet. So there were three diets in the Bible and we've given them names. In Genesis chapter one and verse 29, we call that the original diet, the original diet, right? So the first diet ever given to man What's the diet that's being celebrated and this, that is you know, rapidly growing around the world as we see more and more uh, vegan restaurants opening up? They're celebrating this, this concept, this idea, this trend that really has its roots where? In the Bible, in the word of God. So we call that the original diet. And I'm going to talk some more about that, but also talk about Genesis 3.18, 
the restoration diet. So there's a diet that had a purpose. In fact, I would even go so far as to say that each one of the diets had a purpose in the scheme of time and for the same purpose, the same reason. There was one thing that was at the, the base or the foundation of each one of those diets. And then in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 3, you see we're progressing on just like we were looking at that scale or that, uh, <coughs> that graph, excuse me. And we saw, we saw that, that it started out with an original diet and then there was a second diet, which we call the restoration diet. And then finally, there was the emergency diet. What was that emergency? It was a flood. There was a flood and it destroyed all the vegetation. So it was an emergency. Now we begin to see that science is catching up. And that's the reason that's pulling people almost as a gravitational pull towards a, a healthier lifestyle and a healthier diet. And you know what? At the end of the day, everybody wants to live longer and have a healthier, um, more fruitful and energetic life. And the science is beginning to bear out that eating the things that are found in the garden from the beginning are the very things that actually extend your life. In fact, here in this study, they found that eating one handful of nuts five or more days a week will extend your lifespan by at least, at least at the bare minimum, two years. Now, who wouldn't want a proposition like that? Who would reject the idea of extending their life, right? And it seems that now we begin to enter into this idea of the purpose behind the diet. Because think about that. The world, the world we live in has a lot of issues, right? We have a lot of sickness. We have a lot of death. We've had a year and a half now, almost, of a pandemic where the fear, global fear of, of catching a virus that could shorten your life. And boy, when we start to talk about and begin to see the evidence of the effects of a, such a pandemic, you know, we have mass hysteria. I mean, it, this was pandemonium around the globe because people feared the loss of life. And we saw the loss of life. We saw people dying in crazy numbers right here in the, in the US. Um, and now we see the, um, the untold number of lives that are being lost in India right now as the pandemic, the coronavirus begins to ravage that country. So when you start talking about a diet that potentially extends life, well, people are very interested in that diet. Now that's in us for a reason. I mean, it's the basic human, that's, that's a basic human characteristic, survival of the fittest, the idea of, you know, preservation of life or preserving life, extending life. But it didn't begin with us. It actually began with a diet. Let's keep going here. And in addition to what I just shared with you, we find that people who eat a certain amount of nuts and seeds, they tend to not only live longer, but also suffer fewer deaths from cancer, heart disease, and respiratory disease. Cancer, heart disease, respiratory disease. Why do I, why do I linger on that? I linger on that because those are the three major 
lifestyle diseases that lead to premature death in the world, especially in the United States of America. What's number one? Heart disease. Now, what's interesting is that heart disease, heart disease, the number of people who suffer from heart, uh, a heart disease or heart episode, uh, say for instance, a heart attack or stroke, the number is crazy. It's amazing. The number of people every 30 seconds or less, someone suffers a a cardiac episode, heart attack, every 30 seconds. Since I've been talking, several people, and it's interesting right now in my era, I'm hearing an ambulance. I wonder what was the issue. But a lot of times when you hear the paramedics, it could be someone just suffered a heart attack because heart disease is the number one killer in America, probably in the whole world. Second is cancer, creeping up very close behind it. But we're always researching cancer. We're always looking at, you know, what can we do? How do we beat cancer? How do we overcome cancer? So that's number two. Number three is upper respiratory diseases. Now that's interesting in light of the fact that the COVID-19 coronavirus, it affects your, um, your lungs and your ability to breathe, your, um, your cardiopulmonary um, systems. So we see then that by eating the diet that was in the very beginning actually addresses the very disease processes that we see today. Now, I'm gonna pause right here and I want to sort of bring out this idea just a little more in your mind. Consider with me. I hear something in that. In the beginning, there was this diet. And this diet came as a result of something or someone. The results of the diet, the diet if we fast forward to 2021, we see the very diet that was in the beginning has amazing benefits to extend one's life, number one, and number two, to actually fight certain diseases, namely the number one, two, and three lifestyle diseases that lead to premature death. Now, pause right there and think about it. Think about that for just a moment. Is this a coincidence? Did the, the almonds and the walnuts and the, pe the pecans and the apples and the, and the oranges and, and the different things that have seeds in them, uh, the nuts and the seeds, did those things suddenly at a certain time begin to be healthy to the extent that they could actually extend life and actually counteract the effects of these lifestyle diseases? or even thwart them altogether. That would be a real serious coincidence, wouldn't it? So I don't think it's a coincidence at all. I think that there's something else behind it and I'm inviting you today because you might be, this might be new to you. You heard about a plant-based diet, but you don't really know what it's all about. In fact, I'm here and people just had lunch and someone actually said, uh, this is not vegan. In fact, or is not plant-based. I avoid those things. They said that. I didn't say anything. I just listened to what they said, but my mind was thinking about what you're seeing here is evidence-based information that says, well, you may not, you may be avoiding it, but one thing you won't be avoiding is a shorter life. By the way, the person who made the statement, and I'm only talking about less than 45 minutes ago, 
suffered a severe heart attack and now has a scar on his chest with several stints in his arteries. You know what a stint is, right? That's to, to open up some form of occlusion, they call it, or some type of blockage. In other words, the blood flow, the flow of blood through the artery, arteries is hindered by something that's clogging up the arteries, blocking it. Well, what is that thing that's blocking it? Um, is it little tiny nanobots? Some type of, you know, robotic, microscopic, robotic activity in the body? Mm, no. What is it? Is it just something someone's born with that just is growing inside the arteries? No. It actually comes from a diet other than the one that extends life and fights disease. And that is a diet that was under the emergency plan, which I shared with you in Genesis 9 and verse 3. So again, I'm trying to draw the mind to what was the intent of the plant-based diet. The origins of it actually give us a clue what was behind it. Now, in a moment, I'm going to then talk about what came second, but let's focus on the original. Now you see here, it talks about um, what actually packs the greatest punch and that's vegetables or herbs. We'll get to that in a minute. So I'm gonna turn in my Bible and if you have a Bible, turn in your Bible to the book of Genesis. Some of you on the call, uh, you have Bibles. Some may not. So I'm going to turn to mine, and I'm actually going to read to you what it says. All right? Now, I'm in Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And the first thing it says in Genesis chapter 1 that I want to draw your attention to is in verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. This was the beginning before man existed. And what we want to do by looking at these Bible texts is to understand why did God give man a plant-based diet? What was behind it? Did he look at the scientific evidence? You know, God knows the end from the beginning. He knows things that will happen before they happen. Maybe, maybe perhaps he looked down the corridors of time and he looked at 2021, and he saw these studies and he says, hmm, they're going to have a really good study in 2021. I think I ought to do something that is going to, uh, now that man has shown me this, of course not. God knows things before they happen, right? But let's figure out who God is in this whole plant-based experience. And what was his purpose? Genesis 129, I mean 126. Let's go there first. This is the first time God is talking about making man. <clears throat> All right, so here, verse 26, he says, and God said, I mean, it mentions it earlier, but here is more, it's, it's more expanded upon, okay? So it says in Genesis 126, it says, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness okay stop right there it says let us make man in our image and after our likeness now at this point what do you know about god what does that verse tell us about god first thing it tells me is there's some plurality here what I, what I mean by that is there's more than one. God is one, but he's in separate persons. Because otherwise, it would say something other than, let us make man in my image. No, he says, in our image. So what we see first and foremost is that God 
is making a man after his own image according to his own likeness and that image and likeness is according to his specific characteristics and those characteristics are that he is a god that is plural more than one right that says that there's something relational that's taking place in other words it's almost like a mother and a father a husband and a wife they say you know honey we've been spending time together for many years now and i love you and you love me let us make a little baby in our own image yeah let's do that yeah according to our likeness you know <clears throat> maybe he or she will have your eyes and um have my hair and blah 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 you know there's a relational aspect to this somebody might need to um to uh, mute their phone because I'm, I'm hearing some 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 background information or back, background noise not necessarily information but when a husband and a wife do that they create a child after their likeness for a purpose and that purpose is relational so the very first thought that god had was i desire listen i desire uh, an extended relationship i desire to we desire to expand our relationship beyond right here where we are we want another being like us different from us but like us according to our own image so the first thing is god desires a relationship he's got one but i read somewhere that perfect love is not manifested until it is expressed and the expression of love was in the making of another being. Again, someone who doesn't have their microphone muted, I would um, ask you, please, is there something that someone wants to say to me? Okay, all right. So if you could mute your, your phone so that we don't have any disruptions, appreciate that. So what were we saying? We're talking about a God who wants to express his love in the creation of another being in the same way that a husband and a wife would do when they decide to have children because they desire to express their love beyond each other to include another being. That's what God was doing. Follow me on this. So that's what it says in Genesis 1.26. And verse 1. 27 it says so god created man in his own image in the image of god created he him male and female created he them that just simply means that within a man and within a woman is the capacity to create both male and female that's the science right and we're told that god blessed them and and told them to multiply in verse 28. Then in verse 29, notice after he decides, I want a relationship, let's make someone just like us. The first thing that God does is he tells them what to eat. Hmm. That's what verse 29 says. Verse 29 says, and God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed. To you, it shall be for meat. When it says meat, it's not talking about hamburgers or chicken or fish. It's talking about food. That's the word for food in the old King James. But it simply means food, right? It just means food, but the, it uses the word meat. Even if it was saying specifically, and it does here, you're going to eat uh, seeds and you're going to eat fruit, and that's going to be your meat, right? So it's interesting that God, then watch this, 
in verse 30, it says, and to every beast of the field and to every fowl of the air and to everything that creepeth upon the earth, wherein there is life, I have given every green herb for meat, see, food. And it was so. So God gives a menu to man and he gives a menu to the animals. Right? They're very different. He didn't say animals eat the, um, the seed and the grain and so forth. Just eat the herb of the field. He didn't say to man, you're going to eat the green herb of the field. You're going to eat fruits, nuts, grains and seeds. Right? Because why? Because God desires a relationship. Now watch this. When you get over to chapter two, chapter two, I hope you're following this, this study because we want to really get to first and foremost, why did God give a plant-based diet in the beginning? What was behind it? And is there a connection to why we're seeing the extension of life and the fighting of disease in what God gave in the beginning? Quick story, my mother, um, before I have a, had an understanding of uh, plant-based diet and what was healthier in terms of what to eat, uh, grew up, I grew up eating what my mother prepared and what my mother made and what she herself ate. And it was, it involved any and everything until it was interesting. The doctors, she got so sick with heart disease that the doctors told her she could not eat those things anymore. Um, and when she did, uh, she actually had her life cut short prematurely as she died at a young age. I thought it was old then because I, most of the people in my neighborhood in the African-American community um, actually had, you know, short lives. And not because of some trauma or some type of, um, you know, uh, violence, but simply because they did violence to themselves through smoking, drinking, or how they ate. It was lifestyle related. And I saw people in their late 50s, early 60s, for sure, in wheelchairs and, you know, slowly living a very miserable existence as they even continue to do the things that was really killing them, right? So, so this is important for us to understand as we look at how God intended right in the beginning to have man be in a relationship. And after he had determined a relationship, he then determined a menu. Why did he determine to actually have a certain menu work with the actual making of man and the relationship. We'll see, we'll see right here now. So when you get to, in chapter two, let's go a little further. In chapter two, as we look at verse, well, first thing we should point out, we should point out in chapter two, that God then forms man after all this preparation, all this planning. God then says in chapter two, verse seven, it says, and, God, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man became a living soul. Notice what he does next. Listen very carefully. If you're not reading along with me, in verse eight, it says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Now, you can jump right over. You can just skip over that leapfrog over and just kind of keep going and, and just look at this stuff as allegory and just good storytelling, if you will. Or you can stop and say, why did you do that? You know, one thing I love about little children, I love about, something I love about little children you know, I have nephews and nieces and I've had my own children. And I think it's interesting how young children often, you tell them something, well, they ask a question and you give them an answer and then they go, well, why? And you say, okay, because of this, this and that. And they say, why? And then, you know, you, you, you give more information and they go, why? And they just have this long litany of why, 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 why? And, you know, 
any good parent or any uh, person who you know, feels the responsibility of educating a small child, you're actually encouraged by that because it shows that natural curiosity of a child and you want them to be curious so that they can learn, they can build upon the things and you can build, help them to build a, a framework, a worldview and all that. So you encourage it. You don't get upset with it, at least you shouldn't. What do you think, what do you think God is when, what he's like when, when we ask questions? We're like, why did you place man in the garden like that? Why did you, why did you make man in the first place? You know, some people ask that question. Why do I even exist, you know? And without this framework, people can go in all different types of directions and sometimes wrong directions. And even, especially now in this era of COVID-19 where people's lives have been disrupted and people don't find meaning in life and they don't see value in themselves. And many people, suicides and suicidal ideation is up so much so that people are trying to figure out, they're scrambling right now, how to come with a response to, to sh short circuit the increase in the amount of people who are taking their own lives. No value, no meaning. They don't know about the things that I'm sharing with you right now. And even the things that I am sharing, if people even got back to it, they would enter into an experience where even the stress and strain of life would be diminished simply by what they actually put in their mouths and in their stomachs. See, God knew all these things and he knows. Say with me. So let's keep asking the question, why Lord? Why, why did you do that? Why did you put the man there? Why did you put him in a garden? What was it about the garden? Well, we see that God planted the man or planted the garden eastward in Eden. And there he put the man whom he had formed, right? So God places man in a garden, not in a slaughterhouse, not in a bakery. <laughs> he put man in a garden. Then in that garden, you did not have Twinkies that were dripping and hanging down from trees. There was no uh, chicken and biscuits that was on the plants. It was just living food, things that were alive. And that's important to know and understand why you had things or had things that were growing in the garden that were living things. Now, now I want to take you over to um, chapter two and verse 16. For those following along, I'm going to Genesis chapter two and verse 16. Genesis chapter two and verse 16, it says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Wow. So God tells Adam, in this garden where I've placed you, you can eat whatever you want except that. Don't eat that. Because if you eat that from that tree, it's going to cause a disruption. What kind of disruption? A disruption in the relationship is going to shorten your life because the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. You will die. And if you die, or if your life is shortened, so shortens or disrupts the relationship. Now, you may be saying, well, wait a minute. Where'd you, where'd you, how'd you get there? How'd you make that leap? Well, notice something with me. See, the diet that God made for man was a diet of fruit, nuts, grains, and seeds, but also wrapped up in a beautiful package was his food that would cause him to live forever. Think about this with me for a second. God is immortal. 
He's eternal. That means, I mean, you know what it means, but just to give you more context, he lives forever. He's always lived, he's always existed. God is immortal. He does not die. He lives on and on and on. However, God makes a being that is mortal. How does, here's a question, how does an immortal eternal God experience a relationship with a mortal being? Why didn't he just make man immortal also? Well, the Bible tells us in a certain place that God is the only one who has immortality, right? It begins with him and ends with him. And he is, decides and judges who shall have eternity, eternal life. So in the Bible, as it pertains to man, the relationship and food, God determines that in order for he, an immortal being, to have a relationship with a mortal being, one who has a life that is in his hands and it doesn't have that immortality, he gives him a certain diet. He gives him a certain food. He says the tree of life is there. The tree of life is the one that you're to eat from. That's the tree. Because when you when you eat from that tree, the food that is there is going to give you the kind of long life that I need for an eternal relationship. Now, we know that this is the case because after Adam and Eve fell from grace and they then, God has to tell them in Genesis chapter 3, and I'm going to look at that now, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 18, that's where he changes the diet. He gives them something else. Are you ready for this? Genesis chapter 3 and verse 18. Notice what the Bible says. Thorns and thistles. Now, this is after they have eaten from the wrong tree. They ate from the wrong tree, and now they have disrupted the relationship. And God, his heart is broken because his original idea and his original ideal was that man would live forever and ever with him in this wonderful relationship. Who actually, you know, gets into a relationship and only want it to last a little short while? No one. In fact, listen to all the love songs. I will love you endlessly. Our love will be eternal. Forever and ever, we shall be loving one another. All these kind of, sometimes sappy, very, very, um, you know, eternal oriented kind of lyrics, eternity oriented lyrics, you find them in songs because that's the, that is in us in the, as God made us and create, created us, we desire a relationship that's based on love, but for that relationship to last forever. <clears throat> and that's exactly what God wanted. That's what he desired. So when he made man, he made a man who could he couldn't make him immortal. He made him because he hadn't passed the test yet. He hadn't proven or demonstrated himself to be trusted. You know, lots of things to say about that. But keep in mind that God did desire for a long relationship. But Adam and Eve chose a different diet. And that's important to keep in mind. Adam and Eve chose a different diet than the one that God said. And just like the diet today that shortens life, that diet, that diet shortened theirs. So notice what it says in Genesis 3.18. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. So God changes or adds to the diet. He now, as I showed you earlier, he now adds to the diet greens. And now, again, did God look down the quarters of time and, and say, man, there's a study that's going to come out of a very prestigious university. And that research is going to talk about the fact that green herbs, they have a great um, capacity to help fight chronic diseases. 
Harvard University study, research has found that of all the foods associated with protection against chronic diseases, that's cancer, high blood pressure, hypertension, diabetes, greens, that's your collard greens, that's your Swiss chard, that's your broccoli, that's, I don't know that someone mentioned in the last meeting that, oh, it's talking about grass. Grass is an herb. Grass is an herb. And all the things that God made that are green are considered, and whether they're leafy, whether they're grassy, they are herbs. They're classifications. They all come under herbs, right? And they're much more comprehensive than we limit them. But all of those things, kale, collars, all of them, they pack the greatest punch. So God didn't look down at the science. God is the science. He determined what's in it. But because he knows everything, he knew we would need them. Now, notice this, and I'm going to come back around to that idea as we get ready to close these thoughts and this study. And I hope people will stick around for the next presentation because it's going to really get into how you can use a lot of these things medicinally. Why? Because of what I'm sharing with you. God made them medicinally, both topically and for to be ingested because they actually are medicinal. And what does medicine do at its basic core? Extends life. And God is desirous of an extended life in human beings because he desires a relationship, the longest possible one that he can have. Unfortunately, we often short cut God's plan. So like my mother, who actually did the thing that she didn't know the things that I'm telling you. I wish I knew them and could have told her. But you know them now. Maybe some of you or not all, maybe all of you had this understanding, but I'm telling you this, God desires a relationship with you. Just doing this from a tree and putting it to one's mouth determine whether the relationship would be long or short. That's the, that's the most basic way we can ever look at it. The actual act of eating determined how long the relationship would be. That's how it was in the beginning, and that's exactly how it is now. You know, <clears throat> before I share this last thing, maybe I should share it first, and then we'll see what I'm talking about, and then I'll circle back. But as you go to Genesis chapter three, notice God's having that conversation again with the other member of the Godhead. And something interesting is concluded after Adam and Eve have gone ahead and they have eaten from the wrong tree, from the wrong menu. Notice what it says in Genesis chapter three, verse 22. It says, and the Lord said, behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. See, Adam and Eve only knew good because only good was given. But now they tasted of death. God knew about it. And it wasn't something that God ever wanted man to know. So it says here, he's become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, watch this. And now, and now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live for how long? This must just, hold on a second. Sorry about that. The very conscientious deacon, he felt it was a little hot in the office here. And he put on the AC, and that's what you were hearing in the background, but it's too loud. It's cool enough now. But what did you see, as I just pointed out in verse 22? If they had gone and taken another bite from that tree, same tree that was giving them a long life for a long relationship, right? If they had gone in a sinful state, in a fallen state, regardless of whether God wanted to them wanted them to or not, had they taken another bite, they would have been 
eternal sinners. I don't know how that is. I can't explain the science. I don't know the phytochemicals or the antioxidant properties that was found in that piece of fruit, but I can tell you this much. It was a potent piece of fruit and God ex intended for it to be potent so that when man ate from it, he would be in a loving, long relationship with him. But he did not want that to be the case if man was eternally going to be sinful. That makes sense. So Adam and Eve, according to the scriptures, verse 23, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims, those are angels, and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So what does God do now? Adam and Eve have taken of the forbidden fruit and now they are sinners. Well, he has to put them out of the garden. He has to place angels at the entryway to the garden with a sword. You ain't never seen a sword that actually turns every which away. That's some serious business. And that's a serious matter that God wanted to protect this idea of a relationship that was going to be soured, stained, that was going to somehow be something other than what he intended from the very beginning. So he puts them out of the garden and makes sure that they can no longer be partakers of that which would have extended or given them eternal life. But they were, they were not without. We now look forward down to uh, the day that we live. And now the original plant-based diet is popular again. <laughs> I don't know how popular it was after they left the garden. We don't have a lot of information on it. We do know that after the flood, though, um, God never really intended for them to eat meat uh, because, again, for the same reason, we're shortening their life. So do we have evidence of that now? Absolutely. We see that, you know, by eating red meat, can short your, shorten your life by 12 years. You weigh the two. What God intended in the beginning extends your life. Even in, a sin, even in a sinful state, in a broken state, in a depraved state, it extends your life. Now, certainly, if you're already depraved and broken and, and you got all manner of issues that you might have received genetically, right? And then you actually eat the things that shorten your life, then Guess what? So sometimes that which is pinpointed as hereditary may just be what? Eating the same way that your mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, the way they ate and the way it shortened their lives, it shortens yours. But that's not the relationship that God wants. He wants a long life. So he says, now let's get back to uh, plant-based diet. Now let's get back to the original idea that I had because the time is coming now where people are fighting all manner of things like the pandemic, COVID-19, and the variant strains that happen every single week, it seems, and it's global. And people are saying, well, you know what? Those who actually eat a certain way have strong immune systems. Those who eat a certain way, a plant-based diet, they're the ones who actually are able to overcome the comorbidities like diabetes and heart disease and cancer and, and all those type of things if they actually eat what God said in the beginning. So my thought is, even when I did the plant-based summit and we had people who were talking about it and celebrating it, I was happy to be there to be able to say, you know what? This has an origin, and it starts with a God who actually loves us so much and desired to live with us forever that he gave a food in the beginning that was a relational food, if I can say it like that. It was a food that was to, to actually establish and keep and maintain and sustain 
a relationship with his creation. And even when things went bad, he says, I'll give you something that will restore you. Coupled with that, that will actually help you and extend your life. I'll give you greens that pack a great punch. I'll give you seeds and nuts and those things that, and all the type of dishes and the creativity to make certain dishes from those. Isn't it amazing now we can get burgers from the black beans, from black beans, all right? And we can have all type of loaves that are made from seeds and nuts, right? Have you ever had a walnut loaf, huh? pecan loaf, right? Has a consistency and texture of meat that we can actually have, you know, all types of milk products that come from nuts and seeds and grain, rice milk, cashew milk, coconut milk. All these things are no coincidence. They're taking the mind and the heart of man back to not a food, but to a relationship a relationship that God desires to have with us. I close on this. <clears throat> you know, there's a, there's a famous movie, uh, I think it's called The Notebook. And in this movie, some of you may have seen it, it's about a, a husband and wife who, um, she gets Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and she's no longer lucid, she can't remember. Every day he has, you know, there's this thing with The Notebook to help her try to remember, you know, about their marriage and life. She has no clue. Every single day, she doesn't know who this man is. So he's doing these things. And, you know, the premise of the movie, it's, it, and it's, sadly, this is a reality for a lot of people, you know, who uh, have a spouse who comes down with dementia. But they find that dementia, Alzheimer's, is basically like a, a diabetes of the brain or inflammation of the brain, you know? And that inflammation comes from having a meat diet, not only, but that's a big part of it, you know? Um, and it made me think, would that wife or would a husband who comes down with it and then no longer has the relationship with the spouse who many a time, ro he romanced or she romanced, and they said, oh, I'll love you forever. Together we'll be forever. I'll never ever, you know, all the nevers and all these superlatives, you know, that people use in the love relationship. I wondered, would they, had they known, have eaten something that would short circuit or cut short their relationship to the point that they could no longer know the person that they fell in love with? That's what God wonders. If you knew that what you eat could cut short your relationship with me, would you do it? Let's go back to the original diet. But more than that, let's go back to the original relationship. Because that's the one that God extends to you and the one he plans to have with you forever. May God bless you. And may you not only eat well, but enjoy the best relationship ever extended to man. And that's what God. Amen, amen.